So uh, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm the founder of Zydor and the Church of Ambrosia. Zydor is the physical manifest manifestation of the Church of Ambrosia. Uh, the Church of Ambrosia follows what we call the religious evolution doctrine, which I'll get into in a little bit. But basically, we believe that the way that we first became aware that there was something more to our existence was by encountering these mushrooms. Um, I've also done a lot of other things. Before this, I was in the cannabis industry. I was an activist in San Jose trying to get legalization to happen in a good way. Unfortunately, it didn't, and anybody who's really aware of the status of the California cannabis industry, um, you know, it, it's, it's been a huge loss for everybody. Um, unfortunately, at the time, I was going around telling everybody this was gonna happen, and, well, it happened. So now we have what was once a beautiful industry turned into a market where everybody's losing money. Um, Hopefully we don't see that again with mushrooms. But from the religious perspective, there's a whole different use. Um, I also do high dose work myself um, in the range of 15 to 25 grams in a single dose on a regular basis. And some of the tea that I make comes out pretty insane. You can see this blue colored tea that's not food coloring, that's not anything other than pure psilocybin mushrooms that made that. Very, very strong tea, though. Um, yeah, it, also, I have a patent. Um, I was a tech guy before all this. My patent is an automated way to repair any computer, which could have been a completely different life path for me, but the day that I got that patent, I was on the front page of the Mercury News smoking a joint, talking about legalization. So. Obviously, the universe decided that wasn't my path. So how did I get into this work? <clears throat> so we actually opened the church as a cannabis church in 2019, um, January of 2019, before Oakland passed its lowest priority for law enforcement for entheogenic plants. So at that time, I had only ever used a lot of cannabis. And when I say a lot of cannabis, my heyday, I was smoking about two ounces a day to myself. So a, a lot of cannabis, but that was the only thing I had ever tried. Um, Oakland passed their law, and here I was running a cannabis church, and the law that passed said that all entheogenic plants should be the lowest priority for law enforcement, just like cannabis was in Oakland. Um, which is why we chose to open the church up here. So to me, that was a sign that we needed to provide other sacraments for people. And in order to do that, I needed to understand them. Um, out of the different sacraments, really the only one that's, that's safe for somebody to do on their own um, in the privacy of their own home is the mushroom. Not that we don't support ayahuasca or peyote or uh, iboga, any of the other plants that were listed in what Oakland did, but all of those have different requirements. Um, iboga, which is one of the most amazing ones, can actually cure heroin addicts, but the chance that you might die when you're using it is fairly high. So you need to have medical treatment before, during, and after. Obviously, things like that, we're not just gonna say, well, hey, go have your own experience at home not that we don't support it. So knowing and feeling drawn to the mushrooms for a long time, I had to try them myself and understand them. Uh, my first experience was two grams, and that's the fun dose. Um, you know, it's things wiggle a little bit, you're happy, it's what most people are used to. And I had a good experience. But knowing that here I am, the leader of a church, I needed to try the five gram heroic dose put forward by Terrence McKenna. And that's where things kind of started to get weird. So <laughs> the, the five grams was a very intense experience, but I came out of it in a loop. And loops are very common with mushrooms, especially when you get them started. But I came out repeating over and over, 
you need to learn how to breathe, and you need to do more mushrooms. And I must have told this to myself a hundred times. You need to learn how to breathe, and you need to do more mushrooms. After I sobered up, I was like, what do you know, mushrooms? I'm breathing right now. It's something that I do every day. But knowing that the lethal dose for mushrooms was somewhere around five pounds, I wasn't concerned about going a little bit higher. Um, my next experience was 10 grams, which another incredibly intense experience. Uh, on my 10 gram trip, I came out in the exact same loop. You need to learn how to breathe and you need to do more mushrooms. Again, I must have said this to myself a hundred times. This time I decided, okay, well, maybe I should just Google how to breathe. Maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. Turns out, if you Google how to breathe, you'll find a TED talk and you'll find a bunch of doctors talking about, as a society, how we've forgotten how to breathe. And what they're talking about is we're sitting down at desks and we're sucking in our bellies. So what's happened is we've stopped breathing with our diaphragms, which is the muscle that we have to breathe with, and started breathing with the upper halves of our body. So in the TED Talk, they tell everybody, take a deep breath, and you'll see the whole audience go like this. Well, if you breathe like that, you're using these muscles and not your diaphragm. Now, why this is a problem is we have a new illness happening in the elderly. And what's happened is because we stopped using that muscle, it's atrophied. So we actually have a problem where elderly people are having breathing issues simply because they stopped using the muscle that they had to breathe with their entire life. And this is where things got really weird, is I was one of those people. So the question of how did I know that I didn't know how to breathe um, is a pretty deep one. And for me, there's two possibilities, and quite frankly, to me, they're both true. But one of them is that there are entities on the other side, and they were guiding me in my path, and they knew this was the first lesson I needed to learn before I moved forward. The other possibility, which is also true, is something deep inside myself was now able to communicate that message directly to me. Because again, the first time I came out of the five grams, I was sure I knew how to breathe. There was no doubt in my mind that this is something that I do every day, all the time, and I'm doing it right. But it was a fact that I was breathing wrong. And you know, this gets into the knowledge that can come out of these doses. But learn how to breathe and do more mushrooms. So I began my path of learning how to breathe, which actually ended up taking me a couple months to do, retraining my body to use the muscle that we have to breathe with. But before I had fully learned that, I knew I had to do more mushrooms, and I did 15 grams. At 15 grams, this is where entities truly started to come out of the other side and into my existence. And what I mean by that is I could physically see them and touch them standing in front of me and communicate with them. Um, a very intense trip where I was told why I exist, why I'm here, how they brought me here, um, and, and things that, you know, honestly are still hard to believe, but I can't deny them. <laughs> but, out of that experience, I came out in another loop. This one was, there's more knowledge to spread and do more mushrooms. <sighs> so here I'd just done 15 grams of mushrooms and I was being told to do more mushrooms. I was a little freaked out because in all my research prior to this, I, the most I had really ever heard of anybody doing was five grams. So I started Googling high dose mushrooms and came across the late Kalindi E. Now, Kalindi happened to be speaking at an, at an event in Portland the next weekend, and I had the resources to attend. So I went to the event, I walk in the door, registration desk is to my right, standing right in front of me is Kalindi, and he thinks he recognizes me. Now, this is somebody I've never met, the whole reason I'm going to the event 
the first person to interact with me is him. You know, when we talk about alignments happening with the mushrooms, there's, there's really no denying it. Um, but that allowed me to build a relationship with Kalindi, even how short it ended up being. Um, and that's what led to the first spirituality and beyond when we brought him out here to Oakland. From that, uh, now I was confident that, and, and just for anyone who doesn't really know who Kalindi was or what he did, he did 30 to 50 grams of mushrooms in a single dose on a regular basis a few times a year and did this work for over 40 years. So for somebody who was just told to do more mushrooms and was kind of freaking out over 15 being a lot, it was very comforting to know that there's somebody who's been doing this work for 40 years and going far past where I was. So I came back and I did 20 grams. Now, the past the 15 gram mark for me, everybody's a little different, but past that is where I truly break through to the other side. I see and interact with entities that have knowledge they wish to give me um, and have experiences that are really hard to describe. Although I'm sure some of our other speakers are gonna talk about some of their experiences too. Um, but it's really, if you haven't done these doses, it's really hard to describe what actually happens. But leaving your body interacting with entities, gods, aliens, all sorts of things actually happens. Um, but I came out of this dose, <laughs> again in another loop. The journey has just begun and do more mushrooms. So that led me to the highest dose that I've done to date, which was 30 grams. And, and one of the important things about this work is it's not about letting your tolerance build up. In fact, it's the opposite. You wanna let everything clear out of your system before you go back. So when I'm doing these doses, it's not because I've built up a tolerance. In fact, I'm taking steps to ensure that there is no tolerance there. But 30 grams was the first time I had a sitter, you know, which I don't recommend anybody start this work without a sitter. You can do it, but Things get very intense, and um, if you don't know what to expect, it's really good to have somebody there. Um, it's also, you, you know, if you're on 15 plus grams of mushrooms, I mean, really, if you're on five grams plus of mushrooms, you don't want to answer the door. You don't want to deal with anything. You, you need somebody there who can deal with the human things that you can't, and, and that's really their main, main purpose. So 30 grams of mushrooms, uh, another incredible experience. Um, again, this time it was with a sitter. Uh, we were in my bedroom together, and at one point we're sitting in a circle, uh, holding hands and holding hands in a circle with three other entities on the other side. I can see them clearly. She can feel them in her hand. Um, also during that trip, which was something very significant for her, uh, a giant yellow snake came in and wrapped itself around her, and that was a message to me that it was the ayahuasca spirit saying that she needed to go visit her. So when you talk about these other realms and the differences between things like ayahuasca, DMT, and mushrooms, they're really all connected. I mean, even holotropic breathing, you can get to these places through intense meditation, you don't have to take a bunch of mushrooms to get there. But that's the shortcut, and we believe it's the first way that we ever actually experience this. For a while, um, for the church, I was doing a high dose at least every month. Um, that's really difficult to do. These experiences are incredibly intense on your mind and your body. Going back in a month is much easier said than done. So, you know, when some people look at this work, they, they think maybe we're mushroom addicts. Um, 
I, trust me, out of my last 25 gram trip, I came out saying, can I please never do mushrooms again? Uh, Moodoo and the other people there with me said, no, sorry, you're gonna have to do them again. Uh, and, and I knew that too, but you know, it's, I, th this, is, this is not for fun, this is not enjoyable. Um, I'm gonna get into the different stages of the work a little bit later, but everybody's got their own path. A uh, little bit about the church. So I mentioned we started as a cannabis church. Um, to me, cannabis, prior to finding the mushrooms, was really my connection with spirituality in any way. Um, I actually started life as a Presbyterian and then in high school became more of an atheist. And that turned into more of an agnostic, uh, turned into more of spiritual, but that's where cannabis had took me is I believe there was something more but I didn't believe anybody could actually know what there was because you couldn't have the experience. There's no book that I felt could tell me. There's no person that I felt could tell me. Um, we would just have to have the experience. And the religious use of cannabis that I talk about during the sermons and what I believe is something that I first heard from somebody who actually didn't like smoking cannabis. And what they said is every time they smoked, it was like there was a giant inner eye that would turn in on them and show them everything that was wrong with their life. Now, to me, that is absolutely the religious, spiritual use of cannabis, is learning how to use and focus that inner eye to examine your life and what's going on around you. Um, but cannabis can only do so much. Now, hindsight 2020, all my cannabis use and all the experiences that I had up until the mushrooms were all leading to this, and it made complete sense when the entities on the other side told me why I was here and what I was doing. But prior to the mushroom use, I was a little lost. You know, I, I knew that it was the right thing to open the cannabis church, but it's, it's a completely different thing to have the experience versus be in your own head. Uh, with mushrooms, you can have the experience of being the entity that existed before all else. What I call God, the consciousness that existed before all else. Um, one of the really common trips that people have with high dose mushrooms is reaching that place <clears throat> And when some people reach that place, it can be a little terrifying because you no longer exist, nothing exists, there is but one consciousness. When I got to that place, the feeling was one of boredom. Nothing existed, you know, what, what's here? There's, there's nothing. Uh, and when I do high dose mushrooms, I get a clear message. And from this one, it was what I consider one of the, the deeper messages which was actually a question with a couple answers. If you were God, what would you ask yourself? If you were the creator of everything, the knower of everything, what could you possibly ask yourself? Well, the only thing that you might not know is what am I? And once I was given that question, I experienced the creation of space and time, the universe and everything, all of reality. The answer to God's question was to create everything. Without everything existing, it can't know what it is. So the purpose of all of your lives, everyone has a different path, but overall, you are God experiencing itself through all these different ways. So the <clears throat> religious evolution doctrine is basically the new stoned ape theory. Um, the biggest difference is we focus more on what the monkeys will, would have seen. And the way I explain it is, and, and this actually came out of some people doing high dose work and living the lifetime of the monkeys who experienced this. There was a point where our ancient ancestors were chased out of the forest into the plains. And 
you know, we're talking about global warming, forests burning down, their habitat being destroyed. They needed to find a new way to survive. So once they set up their camps, because obviously young ones need to be protected, the next thing they had to focus on was finding food. Now, if you're a hungry ape uh, who's used to living in the trees, you might not know what you can eat. You do know a couple things. You know you can eat bugs, and you know if a bug is eating something, you can probably eat it too. It's a good, it's a good sign. The bug isn't dying, you probably won't die yourself. So the experience that one of the people had was hunting for food and looking for bugs, following a trail of bugs, we were led to the mushrooms. And one brave monkey decided to actually eat the mushrooms. The others, of course, sat by and watched to see what would happen to him. Uh, and being a hungry monkey, these, these mushrooms fresh are actually delicious. So if you're really hungry, filling your belly with them, it, it's, it's a no-brainer. Here, you're starving, you taste this really good thing. Well, they don't have a scale, they're not doing five dried grams in silent darkness. They are filling their belly with mushrooms. What you see when you do this is entities with knowledge that they want to pass on to you. In my case, 2.5 million years later, it was, hey dude, you're using your muscles wrong to breathe with, you need to learn how to breathe. What the monkeys actually experienced, we will never truly know, but to me it's completely reasonable that entities on the other side could have taught them how to make fire could have taught them things that they could eat, could have helped them survive in this new landscape. Um, and to us, this is where religion started. That was where we first experienced there's something more to this existence. What happened over the next 2.5 million years, there's a lot of lost history there, a few comet asteroid strikes that wiped out a bunch of knowledge, and you know, there's uh, a wonderful author named Grant Hancock, and if you do some diving into the rabbit hole of, of his work, you'll find some really interesting stuff there too. But as far as the religious evolution doctrine goes and the religion we follow, we consider ourselves to the, be the oldest you know, we're 2.5 million years old, the first time our ancient ancestors were hungry enough to fill their belly with mushrooms. Safety. So obviously doing a lot of mushrooms comes with some risks. Um, the biggest one that everybody needs to know is about heart conditions. If you have heart conditions, you shouldn't probably do any mushrooms. Uh, there's a horrible story of a 26-year-old woman who had a transplanted heart, and on what's probably about 15 grams of mushrooms died. And this was a, a reaction between the sympathetic system of the heart, where basically her sh heart just shut down. Um, that's an extreme case, but if you have a heart transplant, do not do mushrooms. If you have a weak heart, you probably shouldn't do mushrooms either. You need to be physically healthy. These things are very hard on your system. Things like explosive diarrhea and massive vomiting, I mean, these are part of the, part of the process, especially depending on how you take them. Doing them with a tea, you can reduce the vomiting, but mushrooms are very good at flushing things out of your system. So you don't want to take these high doses and go to a park or go out to a concert or, you know, there's even some people who looked at this event and they were like, everybody's going to be doing 20 grams of mushrooms there. And the people who know what that's like just 
roll their eyes and go, no, 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 we're not doing that. Um, the, the best place is a bed and a bathroom nearby and somebody to sit for you and they don't, they, they aren't your spiritual guru. They are just there to do the human things you can't. Help you to the bathroom, answer the door. If the building catches fire, get you out of it because you might think it's part of the trip, you know. Um, they're, they're there to hold down reality for the human things that you would otherwise need to do. The LD50 on mushrooms, so that's the lethal dose, is for somebody my size, a little over five pounds. The likelihood that you're gonna eat enough mushrooms to kill yourself is pretty much impossible. I, I guarantee you, you get past 20 or 30 grams, you're not gonna keep eating a pound. You, you will. You will stop one way or another if it's vomiting or you just left your body and you can't physically put them in your mouth anymore. Um, but we, we are reaching a stage where there's more and more concentrates coming out. And 25 grams of pure psilocybin is enough to get you to the LD50. So again, once you know how these things work, there's nobody that would consciously take 25 grams of pure psilocybin, uh, but if you did, you could be in trouble. So with the, the raw mushrooms right now, you're pretty much safe, but just be wary of concentrates. Um, the other thing that <clears throat> you really need to know about mushrooms is they vary in potency pretty extreme. Um, there's a group called Oakland Hyphae that has been doing some test results and some psilocybin um, competitions. I believe their lowest test result was somewhere around 0.6%, and their highest was something around 1.8%. So that's a factor of three. So if you think you're doing a gram of mushrooms and you're used to the 0.6%, but you actually do the 1.8%, that one gram is actually three grams. And th this is where it can run into some sticky problems, especially if you don't know that you might see something crazy. Um, I did a lot of research trying to dig into all the people that have unfortunately died on mushrooms. Um, there hasn't been really that many but most of the ones that you'll find are, from my perspective, people seeing something crazy and trying to get away from them. If you don't know that on a high dose, you might see the predator appear in your living room, jumping out your window to get away from it might not be the most logical or illogical thing. It might seem like a good idea at the time. If you know the predator might appear and not to be afraid of it, but instead to go up to it and be like, hey, why are you here? What do you have to teach me? Why am I seeing you? Ask it questions, don't run from it. Mushrooms can't kill you uh, unless you do the wrong ones or you do what's virtually impossible to do and eat five pounds but they can definitely make you think you're dead, and they can definitely show you some stuff that is beyond terrifying that would make any, anyone, especially if they're not prepared for seeing this, try to get away from it. The thing is, it's, it's in your own head. Jumping out the window is not actually gonna get away from it, so don't do it. Um, <clears throat> The other big problem is mixing it with alcohol and other drugs. So unfortunately, one of the reasons a lot of people have a bad perspective on mushrooms is the first time they tried them, they were at a bar or at an event and drinking a bunch of alcohol and their inhibitions were lower and somebody said, hey, you wanna try some mushrooms? Mushrooms plus alcohol is a very weird drunk. It's it can be very uncomfortable, um, and again, the mushrooms are really good at flushing things out of your system, so puking, 
is probably going to happen. And in a best case scenario, you puke and pass out on the ground and some EMT finds you and uh, make sure that you're, you're relaxed and hydrated because that's really all they can do. But you definitely want to know what you're mixing the mushrooms with. Um, other things, antipsychotic drugs like lithium can be a very bad mix. Um, people tend to get violent. Also SSRIs, um, although they don't make you violent, they reduce the effect of the mushrooms. So if you are trying to get to the breakthrough dose of you know, somewhere between 10 to 15 grams, and you're on SSRIs, you might do 15 grams and it feel like an eighth of mushrooms. And that's just how the SSRIs work with your body chemistry. Also, everybody's body chemistry is a little different. Some people are very sensitive. Two grams of mushrooms is enough for them to see entities. Other people, like myself, it takes 15 grams. So it, it really, you got to be careful when you're working with these things, and you got to understand what you're doing. The other big problem is the wrong mushroom. So up on screen, I have a picture of the California death cap mushrooms. And you'll notice they look very similar to psilocybin mushrooms. They are not. You will die. Those grow all over California. So if you're going to forge your own mushrooms, which can be safe and, and good, you really need to know what you're doing. Um, and you got to be really careful of these ones that look like the ones that you want that are absolutely not the ones you want. And then the, the most important thing, and <clears throat> you know, the, it's talked about a lot in psychedelics, but set and setting. You do not want to take 30 grams of mushrooms and walk into a police station. You will have a bad time. Um, on the same level, you don't really want to take 30 grams of mushrooms when you're out in the forest. You might leave your body. Who's going to go find your body? You know, you'll come back to it eventually, but is that before or after the deer starts gnawing on your ear or you know, worse? And it, it, it's also super common for people to strip off all their clothes, so you're, you're naked in the middle of the forest, things like hypothermia, you know, those are real things that can happen. So you definitely want to be in a safe place. Um, what Kalindi used to talk about, and the only way I ever recommend people do these, is a bed and a bathroom right near each other. A and nothing in between you and the bed and the bathroom. You don't want to have a bunch of obstacles you got to hop over or dodge through to find your bathroom. You want to have a clear path and a, a safe place. Um, and you don't really need, you know, a lot of people, especially when they start this work and don't really know what, what the experience are like, They're, they think, well, I should have some cool paintings to look at or some trippy lights to look at. You don't need those. They become a distraction. The, or, or even music. You know, at these doses, you hear and see things. So anything in your physical environment, anything in this realm, can actually distract you or, in some cases, pull you into it. Um, at the right dosage, you can step inside paintings. And if you're not planning on doing that, it can be a big distraction. So what we do uh, at the, uh, so we, we have a project called God Sitters that I've been working on for the past, about the past year, which is to provide a safe place for people to have these experiences and a set of protocols that we're gonna put out there for everybody just to keep them safe. Um, we have a bed on the floor, nothing on the walls, and a clear path to the bathroom. And again, people look at the space and they're like, it's not psychedelic enough for us. And it's like, oh, don't worry, take 20 grams of mushrooms and it'll be plenty psychedelic for you. Um, so set and setting is really the most important. And that, that again goes back to the, you, you don't, for your first time, for sure, you don't want to take mushrooms when you're drunk at a bar or at a concert. Um, these are sacred tools. They need to be done in the right environment, in a safe place, 
And until you understand how you're going to react to them, someone else who's sober physically in the building to take care of any human things you might not be able to. That's the logo for God sitters. Um, I guess I could have switched slides a second ago. Uh, what we're doing at God Sitters is some really interesting work. Um, the general description of what people are going through is it's like years of therapy that happens in a matter of hours. And you know, this is far beyond the micro dose or the uh, normal dose and, and really well, I should explain how we see mushrooms working. So in the, from our perspective, the mushrooms allow you to connect with your soul. So in the microdose, it's like putting a little crack in the wall. At the standard dose, which is, you know, half a gram to an eighth, it's like poking a hole in the wall. And obviously, the more you do, it's a bigger hole. At these really high dose levels, it's like taking a sludge hammer and knocking down that wall. So the voice that you hear on the other side and what you're experiencing from the other side is the true you. It is the part of you that exists outside of space and time. And that's why these, these sessions can be so healing for people. With a therapist, you got to take a good amount of time to break down why you experienced everything and what you're going through. Um, it, it's really, there's a lot of trust there. you got to let them into things. And that can be really difficult to do. When it's your soul that's your own therapist, it's already lived your entire life. It knows every lifetime that you've had before and after this one. It knows every experience that you've been through and every experience that you'll go through. You don't have to take the time to explain your trauma to it. It'll show you. It'll bring up a slideshow of every bad memory that you've ever had and help you understand why you went through that. It's, it's a level of healing that is just not possible really with anything else. But you have to be committed to this. You know, you can't just take a high dose one time and be cured. This is a path and this is work. And especially when you're going through the start of it, you really need a commitment to it. So the stages. Um, the first stage is getting past your trauma. Now, this is any hangups that you have in life these stages can all happen at once in one trip, or each stage could be 10 ceremonies. Um, it, it really all depends on what you have to go through. But the first stage is dealing with any trauma that you have from this lifetime so you understand it. Once you get past that, you're ready for the next stage, which is understanding what you are outside of this body. Because we're all meat puppets. This is not the real us. This is a manifestation of us in this space and time. What we really are outside of this body is something eternal. And that's what you really need to understand. And really, if everybody could get through these first two stages, if the whole world could get through these first two stages, it would be a much better place. The third stage is what Kalindi and the other people like myself who do these doses on a regular basis, we do, and that stuff gets really weird. It's not for everybody. It's very intense, very terrifying, very physically taxing. Um, I, my, my last 25 gram trip, I ended up pooping in the shower and uh, ass up in the shower with water flooding the bathroom floor. Um, Mudu, who's going to be talking after me, was there to experience that. So thank you for being there for me, because 
when I came out wet, I wasn't even sure how a towel worked, much less the uh, nice, comfy robe that I needed to put on. So, um, you know, it, it's, again, this is not fun. This is because we have to do the work. And not everybody has to do that work. But if everybody could do even the first stage, just get past all your trauma from this lifetime, that would, the world would be a much better place. International High Dose Mushroom Day, tomorrow. So we, or I started this last year after Kalindi passed. Um, you know, it was, the relationship between he and I was one that had just begun. When he left the event, uh, it was, oh, I'm gonna see you again. We have years of working together. We're gonna be doing other events. Um, and to me, this was not somebody I knew well, but somebody that gave me the confidence to do the work that I did, uh, I do. Um, and it was really devastating, because here it was, the, the guy who has all the answers, and if you knew him, he didn't walk around like that. He wasn't walking around saying, I have all the answers to the universe, or even calling himself a master of mushrooms, but he was the closest thing this world has ever had to a master of the mushrooms. And the amount of knowledge that we lost in this realm with his passing was pretty deep. Um, he touched a lot of people and started a lot of people in their path and provided grounding for a lot of people to do the work that they do. I felt the best thing we could possibly do is honor him with a day. And you know, it, it, it happens to be a good day to 410, it's right before 420, so in the same month of celebration that many of us like to do. Um, but that's where this came from. It is a day to celebrate this work and to remember this man who did it for 40 years. And I'm not sure how I'm doing on timing. What are, where are we at? We're ready for Moodoo? I don't know. What, what time is it? Uh, 20 minutes for the first show. Oh, okay, okay. Well, we got some more time. I'll talk about some more weird stuff. Um, okay, so the experiences that I have on these, I don't really like to talk about too much um, because they're really pretty unbelievable. You know, it's things that, it's almost impossible to describe with words, and the experience itself is beyond HD. It's, you're not just watching a TV, it's not just a headset. At the right dosage, you can touch and feel these entities on the other side. They are physically in the room with you. You can also leave your body and go to completely other realms. You know, a, a lot of people, especially in the psychedelic community, talk about 5D reality. These doses take you far beyond that. There are many more than five dimensions. Many, many, many more. The work that people who are drawn to continue doing this work have to do is, is beyond anything you could really possibly describe, and it really depends on who you are and what you need to do. Um, the, the one thing I can say for sure is I haven't died yet. I, I've actually died plenty of times, but I always come back. Um, to give you an idea of how terrifying some of these experiences can be, there was one experience where I'm, you know, I, I, until we got the God Sitter's house, I did these in my bedroom by myself. I watched as golden beetles devoured my flesh and fell to the ground. I could feel this happening. It was happening to me. And then all of us reformed into a golden bowl. Now, 
the message that I got out of that and something I hadn't actually been aware of at that point is that the one of the main deities that was worshipped before Christianity was actually a golden bull. And that's talked about in the Bible where uh, Moses goes up to talk to God and his followers build these effigies to a golden bull. I had no knowledge of a golden bull, but I became one. <laughs> and, and then I started to learn what the golden bull meant and what it was. And you know, it, it, it awakened a whole nother set of knowledge that I was unaware of. When we get into the religious texts of today, there's a lot of hidden knowledge in there that people interpret many different ways. But I can guarantee you, if you do some of this high-dose work and go back and read the Bible, you will have a completely different perspective on it. And there are undeniable parts of it that are the psychedelic experience. Now, this, this could have happened through a bunch of different ways. It could have been them consuming a sacrament. Um, but it also, just as possible, could have been a natural DMT release in their brain. I believe it's Isaiah where he talks about falling to the ground and then seeing a golden being with four, four heads and four wings that he interprets it as an angel that has information for him. That is one of those experiences you can have if that's an entity that you need to work with. Um, that sort of thing can absolutely happen on these high doses. So going back and reading religious text of the past with a different perspective, you can see how there's a lot of truth that probably came out of these experiences and then you know, got muddled by humans over hundreds or thousands of years. But there is core truth that comes out of these that is not from you. You know, it's, it's not knowledge that you have. It's not locked away somewhere inside your brain. Maybe there's a chance some of it's locked away in your DNA and you're able to read it. Um, but this is really, you are experiencing the other side of reality and interacting with things that are over there. Um, uh, another... <laughs> Uh, another horrible experience that I had uh, was one of the reasons I recommend everybody wear Depends when they're doing these high doses and fast for 48 hours before. Um, there is an epic Reddit post where I put the pictures of me crashing back down into reality uncontrollably peeing and pooping in my own bed. Now. I had to have that experience, and again, there was messages out of all this. That one was all about handling your own shit <laughs> in many different ways. So if you are going to do this work, I highly recommend fasting before. 48 hours is great. 24 hours is minimum. But the less shit that's in you, the less shit that's going to come out of you. And if you do get in that situation, you know, a, a lot of people when I say you should wear Depends are like, oh, I don't want to wear adult diapers, but uh, I look at it as a safety helmet. You know, you, do, you don't wear a safety helmet to a construction zone because you plan on getting hit in the head. <laughs> but I guarantee you, if you get a hit in the head, you're glad you had it on. So, you know, get over wearing the adult diapers. They're your, they're your safety gear. Um, also, fasting, I, I cannot, I mean, that, that experience was because I had too much to eat and I didn't fast and I, my ego was a little too high at the moment and I was thinking, oh, I know what I'm doing. Well, I needed to learn how to handle my own shit better. Um, the, <laughs> there, there, there's so many, so many things about these experiences, it, it's hard to even know what to tell you all. Um, it, it's really an experience you have to have, but you've got to make sure you're prepared. You know, this is not the sort of thing you're doing for fun. You're not doing it at a concert. 
You can do it by yourself, um, but you gotta have your environment set up right and you gotta really be prepared for everything. The uh, path that I took going from five, 10, 15, 20 to 30 is not what anybody should do. That was the mushrooms saying, yo, dude, you need to get up to speed and you get, need to get up to speed right now. Uh, what Kalindi recommended, and I absolutely recommend in most cases, is starting with a five gram heroic dose and then increasing by two grams when you feel comfortable to do it. So five, seven, nine, 11, at a certain point, you'll know how you react and you'll be able to be comfortable without a sitter. But before you know how you're gonna react, you really need a sitter. Um, one of the experiences that I had at the God Sitters location was uh, a, a very close friend who needed a lot of help, but she, during one of her experiences, was foaming at the mouth and hyperventilating, and uh, not because of something physiologically wrong with her, because she was transforming into a dragon and couldn't accept that it was real and was freaking out. Um, there, there was a bunch of lessons that came out of that. Another one is what's around you. A lot of people think they need a shrine or crystals and you can work with crystals and you can work with pictures but you need to know what you're doing. If you're just getting started on the path, the likelihood that you might leave your body and land on a giant chunk of obsidian that you brought into the room for you, it's not something you wanna do. Um, so really, you, you don't wanna have anything that you can accidentally hurt yourself with, and that's the other reason you wanna have somebody there, um, not necessarily because they need to do what I was doing and wipe the spit off her mouth so she didn't aspirate on it, but also if she had hit her head um, mushrooms aren't gonna kill you, but that's a physical injury that now happened and somebody sober needs to be there to help you. Um, it's very important that you have the right environment. Uh, some of the other things that have come out of the God Sitters location, um, we, we have people, you can't drive yourself, you gotta bring somebody, or somebody has to bring you. Uh, one of the painful lessons that happened was somebody brought somebody who needs to do work themselves and was a recovering uh, meth addict who, while this person was in ceremony, left and got very, very high. So the sober driver came back when she got out of her dose high on meth. And that was a very uncomfortable situation for everybody involved. You know, we had to make sure everybody was safe and that she could make it home without somebody that was on meth driving her. And you know that was, again, a very, very important thing. Who's around you, the energies that they bring, the responsibility that they have. Yeah, your driver might be bored for four or five hours while you're in this. They can leave and go you know, smoke a joint or something, but if they're gonna leave and get too drunk to drive or do some other drugs that really take them into a bad space and then they come back and you've just had the most healing experience of your life, that's not who you need to have around you. So this applies to sitters, but also the people who are helping you get to the session too, is you really need to know who's helping you, who's gonna be around you, um, and what's gonna happen when they now need to help you, because they, they need to help you get home. But obviously, if they're too fucked up, you don't want to have somebody like that drive you home. And we weren't, we weren't going to let that person drive the other person home. So it's, it's very important, the energies that you bring with you into these sessions around you. Um, again, there's just so many lessons that we've learned out of the God Sitters Project. Where we're at with that right now is we're 
opening it to a very small circle um, so that we can learn everything we need to learn before we open it to the wider church and to more people. Um, if we hadn't already done the, I, I think we're at about 25, maybe 30 sessions that we've done over there, we would definitely, and tried to just take random people in, it, it could be a real disaster. Um, you, you need to, if this is the kind of work that you want to do helping people go through these, you need to learn everything you can learn before you have to have the painful experience. Um, you know, the best way to learn, obviously, is you have the bad experience, and then you remember, oh yeah, okay, next time. Um, but that is really not the way you should, you should learn things. Uh, what? Sorry, time? Ready for Moodoo? 235? Okay, you ready? Okay, okay, well, so again, we're, we're trying to cram a lot of information into a short period of time. Um, so I, we will, I will be available to answer plenty of questions after, though you might have more questions for our other speakers. Um, in all honesty, they have been doing the work much longer than I. Uh, my whole experience going from five to 30 grams happened in about two months. Um, again, this is not, that's not normal. That's the mushroom saying, hey, you're the head of a mushroom church. Um, let's get you up to speed. And it was overwhelming, but it was a, a training program for them. Uh, these people have been doing this work for years um, and have a lot of a very good experience to talk about and I'm excited to hear them talk. So thank you all for being here. And Mudu, who is uh, Kalindi's star pupil, traveled around the world with him. Um, is also an activist from Detroit who helped them pass their recent law and does a lot of good work out there. Is an amazing person, and I'm glad that I know him. And uh, we're about to hear what he has to say. Thank you all.